Listeners, beware! You're in for a scare! Howdy folks, welcome to Nightmare and Fear Street and R.L. Stein Podcast, and I am your host, Zach. And a couple days ago, I was walking through the graveyard with my iPod and listening to, you know, cool music just to get into the Halloween spirit. When all of a sudden, they did like the radio thing and started changing. Until they got to this really cool Goosebumps, like, remix of the theme song... And I was like, what is this? Whoa, rad cool. Right after it finished, I got an email from the actual person that composed it, my friend Dream Reaper, AKA Troy. It is really cool. It's been making the rounds on Dead Central, a lot of horror themed websites because you know, they've been looking for a bunch of spooky, scary music to play to parties. So Troy got to compose this theme and it is amazing. He actually did it from scratch. I love it. And he was like, can I just play it at the end of our episode like no we're not going to do that because here at nightmare on fear street we believe in community so he is actually going to talk all about his experience by making the song as well as his deep love for goosebumps and everything spooky scary and he actually is a really big collector of the goosebumps like top trading cards so you're going to get a little bit of history lesson in those because i found that to be very fascinating because i had never really experienced those if you guys stick to the end you'll actually hear the goosebumps theme song that he composed and it's super radical, so guys, check it out, and for further ado, here's Troy. Thanks, Zach and Meg, for having me on the show. Uh, my name is Troy Durkee, and I make music as Dream Reaper, which is heavy electro inspired by 80s horror movie synth scores like John Carpenter, or a more recent example might be the Stranger Things soundtrack, which is a genre commonly known as synth wave or dark synth. I recently released my own version of the Goosebumps TV show theme song, which is how I came to be on the show today. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about that and my music and growing up with Goosebumps. And so Dream Reaper, it all, it all really started for me uh, back when I saw the movie Drive, which came out in 2011. Um, that movie became well known for its soundtrack, which featured a number of songs inspired by 80s synth music and featured artists like Kavinsky, College, and Electric Youth. And I'd always liked that kind of music, but only after the movie came out what, did I become aware that there was like a whole modern scene based around this sound. And at that time, it didn't really have a unified genre name, at least as far as I was aware. But eventually, at some point, people started calling it Synthwave, which caught on, and I was pretty happy that it did because it made it a lot easier to find that kind of music. And Synthwave, pretty diverse, like a lot of different influences. Like on one hand, you'll have the light, summery, happy, nostalgic type vibes that were in similar to the soundtrack of Drive. And then on the other hand, you can have music influenced by horror movies and um, much darker and heavier and basically completely different sound. And that sound has come to be known as Dark Synth. And I've made a pretty big variety of music pretty much my whole life. So I originally would, um, I'd make, you know, both the light and the dark stuff. But the reason I Settled on Dream Reaper and the darker sound was after hearing an artist called Carpenter Brute. Um, he was really just doing things on a whole nother level, and I really expanded my idea of what the genre could be. If you listen to my music and like it at all, I, I highly recommend checking out Carpenter Brute. I can't recommend it enough. And so I've, I've released two EPs as Dream Reaper, one in 2015, and my most recent, which is called Astro Blaster, came out in January. And that one I put out on cassette tape, which is actually like really popular in the scene. A lot of people will put their music out on cassette tape and vinyl is big too. Lately I put out a couple of um, remixes and I just released a track called The Summoner for a compilation album for Halloween that a webzine called Brutal Resonance put out. And there's a bunch of good songs on there, so I'd recommend checking it out. It's a free download. Um, and that's actually the song you're hearing right now in the background. And lately I've just been working on a bunch of new music, hopefully for a full length album early next Next year, if not that, then another EP, uh, depending on how things go. And I've got five or six songs basically done right now, and I've been playing them out at shows locally, and people have been really liking them, so I'm pretty excited for where things are going. All right, enough about that. Let's talk about Goosebumps now. I remember probably my first memory when I, I don't know when I was really young. I was aware what Goosebumps was. I like knew the the dummy mascot, Slappy, and I was terrified of him. But I don't know if I thought Goosebumps was for adults or at, at least the big kids. And it wasn't until later in elementary school, probably a few years later, when I first started reading the books myself. I just immediately really liked them. And then at some point, I became a member of the 
either the the fan club or some sort of book club through the the scholastic catalogs they'd send out in elementary school. Um, I know the first pack it came with three books, bookends that you could put on your shelf to like hold the books up, um, a membership card, and I think a bookmark. And then there's this screamer type keychain toy. It was small and green and you'd hit a button and it would scream at you. I'm sure I scared my mother with that on several occasions. It seems like something I would have definitely done. Um, and I actually recently found my old membership card when I was back at my parents' house about a year ago. I was pretty surprised I still had it. I was surprised to find it. It was a, it's a, like a lenticular type card where you, you switch it back and forth and it shows two different images and it was curly and slappy. I don't know, I've always thought those were pretty cool, so I was happy to find that again. One of my best friends in elementary school, he claimed his brother had every single Goosebumps book, a, a complete collection which I didn't even think was possible. I didn't, I thought there was an infinite number of books, certainly hundreds, if not a thousand. Like, I didn't know. You know, nowadays you can just Google it and find out pretty easy. And I guess you could have back then, but it just never occurred to me when I was a, a younger kid. It just seemed like every Goosebumps book I saw was one like I'd never seen before. Like I didn't recognize the title or the cover. There's just so many. As far as I can remember, I never really had a favorite book out of the series growing up, but I definitely always Really liked the Give Yourself Goosebumps series. Just choose your own adventure books in general were always my like favorite kind of books. It was just, it was basically magic to me that you could make decisions and you'd affect the story. And then later when I you know thought about it more, it just seemed like the creativity that would go into writing one of those was, it was really impressive to me. And I was, I've always thought it'd be cool to maybe write a book like that one day. As for the TV show, we always rent movies as a family at this local video store called Mr. Movies that was in my hometown. Rest in peace, Mr. Movies. I think it's a liquor store now. It's, as far as I'm aware, the liquor store doesn't carry any Goosebumps movies of any kind. And actually, the even when it was Mr. Movies, even after DVDs were definitely the, the mainstream format, they only ever had VHS tapes there for Goosebumps. I don't know if that was maybe before the DVDs came out or what, but it was always just VHS tapes. And, and that was always one of the excuses my dad gave me for why we weren't renting Goosebumps tonight. And... I don't know, I was pretty much the only one in the family that wanted to anyway, and um, I was successful on more than one occasion. I got I got a little taste, and I, I definitely caught the show on TV a few times, but I remember I always thought that they, they must have edited out, like, the really scary parts, because, you know, they, they can't show Goosebumps on TV. You know, pretty ridiculous, considering it's a Y7 rated show. Um, and yeah, now you can get the whole series on Netflix. Pretty crazy how much things change. Um, and when I think of Goosebumps now, even just, like, seeing the logo, Really brings back a lot of memories and nostalgia. Also just the artwork on the books and like the aesthetics of the design definitely influences like what I thought was cool as far as horror artwork goes. And I really enjoyed the episode you guys had recently or your last episode with Tim Jacobus. I thought that was a really interesting to hear him talk about his experiences. And I definitely tried to emulate his art style when I made the cover for the remix I did. And when I was looking at inspiration for the artwork, um, I saw on a, lot of, on a lot of the covers they had the promos for either the glow-in-the-dark stickers or trading cards. And I looked up glow-in-the-dark stickers, like how much they'd cost to get made, and they're actually kind of expensive, way more expensive than normal stickers, at least for the quantity I was looking at. But the trading cards, I found out about the Topps trading cards. First, I was just going to buy like a small amount and in include them in merch orders and I just including little like funny bonuses and I don't know, just fun little gifts. So I was only planning on buying like a few, but I found this huge lot of them online. Somebody selling, um, it was nearly 900 cards and they wanted kind of a lot for them, but I had just, at the same time, I found out I won, I got second place in this remix competition and so I decided to spend all the prize money on buying these cards. And I, I tried to talk the seller down in price, but they would not budge, like, at all. Like, I, they mentioned multiple times how they spent way more than they were selling them for and how good of a deal I was getting. And, and ultimately, I guess they were right, because these cards are only going to go up in price. Everybody listening to the podcast is aware of that fact. And so, for those unfamiliar with the cards, they're they're different from the ones that came with the books, like the pop-out perforated ones. Um, a company called Tops, which is one of the big sports card companies that does a lot of non-sports cards too, put out a set of Goosebumps trading cards in 1996. Because you know, there's Goosebumps everything else. You gotta have trading cards. Um, and there is one series of 54 cards, which you could buy in packs of six or eight, or you could just buy a box of the complete set all at once if you weren't up to the challenge of collecting them all. 
Some cards had illustrations based on the books. There's these Ghouls Gallery cards, which was a set of nine cards that had a different famous monster or bad guy from the books, uh, which formed like a mini poster if you line the cards up in a grid pattern. The Goosebumps on TV cards, was, which were my favorite. Um, they're the stills from the TV show. And on the backs, they'd have a short description about the book or episode that the card was based on, and then sometimes like a trivia question. And then the last card was a picture of R.L. Stein himself with a checklist on the back. A lot of, there's these special edition insert cards, which were only in random packs that had glow in the dark cards, metallic sticker cards, and these monster magic cards, which were some of, they were heat sensitive. You could like put your thumb over a part of it for a few seconds and then an image would appear. Um, and then those cards would be the rarest since they were only in certain packs and then the stickers especially since a lot of kids would have used them by now. The lot I bought came with a few of the inserts, but not that many and none of the card, or none of the sticker cards. I actually made a spreadsheet of all the cards I got after I sorted them. And there's no way to know for sure, but I figured I have at least one of the largest collections in the world. I don't know who would have too many more than this, so I wanted to see what kind of data I could extract from them. And if you're curious, the one I got the most of uh, was card number 11, which I got 30 of. And I also discovered that I think the higher number of cards in the base set, the Goosebumps on TV cards, um, are rarer than 1 through 45 because there was a couple that I only got between two and four of each one, which is way lower than compared to the other ones. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And something like that is why I decided to document it in the first place. Keep in mind that this is just one sample from one seller and who knows where they got them or what they did with them beforehand. So the data could be skewed. Besides the goosebumps on TV, the TV still cards, favorites would probably be number one, which is this, it's a family of skeletons sitting at a dining table. I really like the art on that one. And then also number 29, which is like a Grim Reaper type character with a cool orange background. It's really ominous looking. I really like the art on that one too. So it was about six months ago when I was just on YouTube and a related video came up that was the Goosebumps intro theme. And so of course I had to play it. I hadn't heard it in years. I remembered it. I remembered liking it. I remember it being spooky, but I was not prepared for just how awesome it was. I didn't remember that at all. It was, it's like still a banger to this day. Before I even finished playing it through the first time, I knew I was going to remix it. A lot of the parts and the melodies sounded already like a Dream Reaper song, and I knew I could do something really cool with it. And so when I decided to make the remix, it definitely wasn't a task I took lightly. I definitely wanted to do the original justice, and I was a little nervous about remixing a classic like that, but I knew I'd only release it if I was really happy with how it turned out. And a lot of people really love the theme, even to this day, so I just wanted to make a version that people would like just as much and appealed to like a modern audience that could be played in like a club or even at a festival or something like that. And I hope it gets played at a bunch of Halloween parties this year and for many years to come. So I'm just going to run through my process of making the track a little bit and play some samples of some parts I really like and maybe even throw in some tips for any producers out there listening. So the first thing I did was actually recreate the original from scratch and tried to match the sounds as closely as possible, like all the different plucks in the pianos and the harpsichord. Um, and that's not always something I always do when making a remix or a cover, but it can, be, can definitely be helpful to have that and then build out from there. And you always learn a lot from doing something like that because it's a really good exercise to learn some songwriting and production techniques that you might not have picked up on your own. Plus it's just like fun to do. And just by matching all the sounds in the beginning, I knew that new parts I'd come up with or melodies that I'd change, it would still sound familiar to people because the sounds were similar. I should say I call it a remix because it sounds cooler, but it's technically a cover. Made everything from scratch and didn't sample anything from the original track or the TV show. I really liked the breakbeat type drums in the original. I originally had something similar in my track, but it just wasn't working and it sounded a little too dated. So I definitely beefed up the drum beat and my typical drum sound which I use in basically all my tracks. It mixes and layers modern drum samples with retro drum machine samples to get what I think is a cool hybrid. And it's definitely an important part of my sound. For any producers out there listening, one tip I have is you should try and, you should be able to listen to just the drum track and never get bored even when it's playing on a loop. And that's when you know it's done. And that's what I do anyway. It probably doesn't apply to all genres. 
And another staple in my sound is the huge distorted bass synth, which is influenced by like French electro music and especially Carpenter Brute. I always try and make the bass really groovy in my songs. I try and walk the fine line between grooviness and heaviness, try to get a good mixture. So for this track, on the main chorus part, or the drop I guess you could call it, I tried to the mirror the main familiar like descending chords and then had it go off and do its own thing for the second half of the bar. And this is an example where I wanted to make sure the bass didn't play a part that distracted or was too different from the original and I wanted it to still fit and sound like it belonged. And originally there was a much crazier bass line but it made the song hardly recognizable so I definitely toned it down and that's the part you hear. I also added slap bass because I honestly believe Every song is made better with slap bass. I sometimes joke that every album I make will have more slap bass than the last until eventually all the songs consist entirely of slap bass, which, you know, it's meant to be funny, but I would honestly love that album. And actually my favorite part of this Goosebumps track is the interlude and how like the slap bass and the synth bass and all the different leads and arpeggios like work together and take turns doing their thing. But right now I'm just going to play a little clip of just the drums and the slap bass soloed on the interlude because well, that's something I'd want to hear if I were listening to this. Yeah, I really like that part, just showing off a little bit. Plus that part has the dog bark sounds, which was very important for me to include because that's a lot of people's favorite part. And here's a fun fact about the dog bark sounds. I actually layered two different dogs together to make the single bark sound. It's a layer of a Doberman Pinscher and a German Shepherd, if you were curious at all. And here's a quick clip of that, because why not? Finally, the Goosebumps voice is that's just my voice pitched down with some distortion and effects. That's all there is to it. Goosebumps. In this next part, I thought really hard about not including, but this is what it sounds like without the effects. Goosebumps. <laughs> oh, God. I'm going to play the cool one again. So much better. And for the producers out there listening, I use Ableton Live um, and Serum for most of the synth sounds and M1 for most of the rest of the sounds. And then the slap bass is cut up samples of me playing slap bass with some M1 on certain parts. I also want to say anybody out there listening, if you have any production questions, go ahead and leave a comment on any of my SoundCloud tracks. And I don't really have any production secrets. I'm a big fan of sharing the knowledge. So go ahead and ask away. And that's pretty much all I got for you guys. If you want to hear more from Dream Reaper, you can go to dreamreapermusic.com and it links to all my other social sites from there. I just want to thank Zach and Meg for having me on this special episode of Nightmare on Fear Street. I'm really happy to share all the stories with you. Hopefully you found some of it interesting. Without further ado, here's my version of the Goosebumps theme. <laughs> 